chapter 24, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 9. Now after five days, Ananias, the high priest, came down with the elders and a certain orator named Tertullus. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And when he was called upon, Tertullus began his accusation, saying, Seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity as being brought to this nation by your foresight, we accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. For we have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander Lysias came by and, with great violence, took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were so. As we begin, let's just refresh our memory a bit. We know that the Apostle Paul has been taken before the uh, governor, Felix. He is the governor of Judea. Uh, Paul had been in Jerusalem, and he had created quite a stir when he had been preaching the gospel. And the anger was so great that it caused some to begin to plot to assassinate him. We saw in Acts 23, 12, and 13, when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Now there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. So there was this plot to assassinate him, and the news of this conspiracy had reached the ears of Paul's nephew, and he had gone and informed Paul, according to Acts 23, verse 16. Paul had him speak to the military commander in charge of guarding him, and the commander, as we saw, assembled 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. These military personnel safely escorted Paul to a place called Caesarea, and they left at around 9 p.m. and marched all night. They traveled northwest to Caesarea. They covered 65 miles. And the governor was informed that Paul had a dispute with the Jewish leaders. Felix determined to hear his case as the problem arose in the area he governed. As far as the commander was concerned, Paul was innocent of civil charges. But Felix determined to wait until the Jewish authorities arrived to confront Paul. That's what's taking place here. And that's why it begins in verse 1 by simply saying, After five days, Ananias, the high priest, came down with the elders. And, notice, a certain order named Tertullus. These gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And so Ananias is what is referred to as a corrupt priest. And he brought a lawyer by the name of Tertullus. He was a professional public speaker. And this man is an unjust man, and he represents men who are enemies of the cross of Christ. Remember that they are especially upset because Paul has been preaching to Gentiles. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, Paul said this. He said, For you brothers became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own countrymen, the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. He went on to say they displease God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. And so they're trying to keep Paul from preaching to the Gentiles, and that's what got them so upset. Ananias and Tertullus and the elders were unwilling to hear the gospel that they might be saved. They are spiritually blind, and they are willingly rejecting the word of God. 2 Corinthians 3.14 says their minds were blinded, for until this day the, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because that veil, the veil is taken away, 
in Christ. And so they're rejecting willingly the gospel. There's a veil over their heart. And Tertullus is now coming as a man who is speaking in opposition to Paul. According to verses 2 and 3, notice how he begins. He says, seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight, we accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. Um, he begins by using flattery. That's what he's doing. He's a very eloquent man, but he's using flattery. And flattery is a common way of approaching politicians. According to Proverbs 29.5, a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. Be very careful when people flatter you. You're not as good as they're saying you are, and you're not as bad as you think you are. You're usually somewhere in the middle. So be very careful when somebody is flattering you because they're usually trying to get something, and that's what he's saying here in Proverbs 29.5, a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. They're using flattery to try and entrap. And so that's what he's doing, and that's how he's speaking to him, and he's saying these nice, flowery things to him, calling him, according to verse 3, most noble Felix. In verse 4, nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear, by your courtesy, a few words from us, for we have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, he even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. And so he begins to outline charges against him. Notice first, he says, we have found this man a plague. He's actually leveling three charges against Paul. He's a plague, a creator of dissension, he says, among us. In other words, he's charging Paul with subversion or sedition, which was a direct violation of Roman law. So we have found this man a plague or a creator of dissension, and that's a violation. Secondly, notice he refers to him as a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Now, he's speaking of one who is a religious heretic. He's a sectarian, is what he's saying. These Nazarenes are regarded as renegades. They were regarded as troublemakers as well as heretics. In Acts 17, 6, it says, When they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And so they're saying that these are people who are doing harm to the nation through their beliefs, the Nazarenes. And then third, Paul disregards other people's religious rights. Now, he's blaming Paul for the riot that had begun, initiated by their misunderstanding of his words, as well as the false accusations that, that he had brought a Gentile into the temple. Remember when we were in chapter 21, they had shouted out something there in verses 28 through 31, they had shouted, men of Israel, help us. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple area and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen, seen Trophimus, the Ephesian in the city with Paul, and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple area. The whole city was aroused, and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple. Immediately, the gates were shut while they were trying to kill him News reached the commander of the Roman troops and the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. So he's actually trying to make it seem like it was a mild thing, but in reality, it was a near riot. So the most serious charge is he's a subversive. That's a charge, by the way, that was leveled against Jesus Christ. That's one of the charges that was used in a civil way to have him uh, sentenced to death. Luke 23, 2 said they began accusing him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying he himself is Christ the king. That's subversion. And so that's a capital offense, and that's why they're using that. Now, this is an unjust charge because you never rebel against, we uh, Christians are not to rebel against proper authority. As a matter of fact, and I'll say this briefly, but it's, it's, it's true. Christians are generally model citizens as we ought to be. The best citizen in, in the city should be Christian. The best worker on the job, the most honorable with most integrity, the most honest, the most set apart should be a believer, don't you think? And 
you know, our, 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 our co-workers ought to see that quality about us. And, and uh, our bosses, those of us who have employers, they ought to see that about us. They ought to say, this is a hard worker. This is an honest person. And that's how we ought to be. Not all Christians are. Sometimes they're, they're anything but that. I, many years ago now, we had somebody in our fellowship who used to serve in the children's ministry. And they had the responsibility of going from place to place. And, and uh, they would pick up money that was uh, to be paid to the company and they were bringing the money back and they were giving the money to the boss and all. And, and what happened is this fellow's wife found out that he was, he was siphoning some of the money. He was pilfering. And she confronted him. She said, you shouldn't be stealing the money. And he says, you know, you're right. I, I shouldn't and I'm going to stop. But I need to take 200 more dollars. Why? because I want to buy a guitar so I can lead worship for the children's ministry. True story. True story. I, I need to steal $200 more so I can buy a guitar for the children's ministry. I remember a guy who donated some electronic equipment to the church and asked for a receipt for it, and, and it was used in our sound ministry many years ago now. And then it turns out that he came and confessed that he had stolen that equipment and used that for a tax write-off for himself. See, uh, I, I guess we can say that's wrong. The most honest people on the job ought to be believers, don't you think? And the people with the most integrity ought to be believers, you would think, because we serve a holy God. And, and Peter reminds us, uh, be ye holy, saith the Lord, for I am holy. We are to be set apart to the Lord. We are to live lives that reflect our knowledge of God. The works that are performed by us ought to bring glory to God. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven, Jesus said. Titus chapter 2 tells us that we are a peculiar people, zealous for good works. And so people ought to see us in such a way so that the Apostle Peter's words would be true. When he says when people speak against you, they'll, they'll feel ashamed because they've been saying things about you in a false manner. He says, why? Because those things aren't really true about you. So our lives ought to be uh, sparkling. They ought to be uh, good lives. And uh, we ought to be those who understand that government has been established by the Lord and that we are under the jurisdiction of, of government. In Romans 13, 1 and 2, it simply says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. There is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. In verse 7 of Romans 13, he says, render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. And so they say that he's guilty of sedition. That second charge was that he's a ringleader. He's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. The, the word Nazarene, by the way, was a word that would be used to reveal their lack of value. Uh, remember that Nazarene would refer to Jesus' hometown. And then think back, uh, of how it says in Matthew 2.23 that he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. And so there was a, a reputation in Nazareth that, uh, that the people there were not to be honored. Um, you know, that was stated uh, in this way, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Because it was known to be a, a city that really didn't have anything that commended itself. And so he'll be called the Nazarene because that shows that there's a lack of value. And so he hoped to capitalize on negative images that the Nazarene would create. To be identified in this fashion was to be portrayed as a troublemaker. He's also a ringleader, by the way. That word ringleader is another word that is referring to a commander. The word ringleader is the most prominent of all. And Paul was one who was a prominent one in extending this message. As a matter of fact, he makes very clear that he was prominent in that way in 
1 Corinthians 15, 10, he said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace toward me was not in vain. I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. He had made it, according to Romans 15, 20, his aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named. So yes, they're pointing to him as being a very important individual. And Paul would answer and say, indeed, though I don't see myself as important, I have made it my chief aim to preach this gospel. But they're saying that they're non-orthodox, they're heretical, and people believed uh, things concerning Nazarene, and therefore Paul would be guilty by association. The third thing, the third charge, is that Paul tried to profane the temple. They actually modified that charge, but that again had to do with Trophimus the Ephesian. And so as they're going through this, what they're trying to do is present the Jewish overreaction as something reasonable. Verse 6 makes it very clear that they're saying, we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. And then he blames sets, verse 7, but the commander Lysias came by and with great violence took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you by examining him yourself. You may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, maintaining these things were so... He ignores the violence that they perpetrated against Paul. They were going to kill him. He ignores that, and he tries to give a very sanitary uh, appeal. But notice what happens in verse 10. Then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, it, Inasmuch as I know you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself because you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone nor inside in the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city, nor can they prove the things which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with tumult. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me, or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council, unless it is for this one statement which I cried out, standing among them concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. So we're going to take some time to look at this, and I'm especially going to spend a few minutes in uh, verse 15 when we get there to share some things with you from that portion. Notice first in verse 10, Paul answers, but he doesn't use flattery. What he does is he states a simple fact. He's, he starts out by simply saying, you have served as a judge for several years. You're experienced. So that gives me confidence that you'll be fair and impartial as you listen. And then he says in verses 11 through 13, it's, it's only been a few days. It's been no more than 12 days. In other words, the events are all recent. It would be easy to find witnesses and they could verify that I came to worship and wasn't disputing and I wasn't inciting. I wasn't doing anything wrong. They cannot substantiate any of the charges that they're leveling against me is what he's saying. But then he goes into verse 14, and this is what he says. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust, this being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense 
toward God and men. Let's spend some time looking at that together. I'll begin by just touching on verse 14, where he says, this I confess, according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers. Notice, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. Now, his faith is settled firmly on what is taught in the word of God. His faith is settled firmly on the law and the prophets. And when you're looking in the law as well as the prophets, he's pointing to the fact that scripture points to Jesus Christ and that he trusts the authority of scripture. Similar to what happened when we saw earlier when Philip encountered the Ethiopian. And as the Ethiopian was reading Isaiah 53 and asked the question, who is he writing of himself or some other man? Remember how we already looked at that, how that from that portion of scripture, Philip began to speak to the Ethiopian and preach to him Christ Jesus. And so you can find Christ is the point in the Old Testament, in the law, as well as the prophets. So the scriptures point to Jesus Christ, and we trust the authority of Scripture. In John 5, 39, Jesus said it like this. He said, you search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. These are they which testify of me. He was saying, Scripture points to me. When he said to them, you search, the word search there in the original language is a strong word, which can also be translated, you ransack. You go from A to Z, look in everything. You're trying to see those things so that you might have life, but you are failing to see that the scriptures point to me as Messiah. That's what he was saying. In Luke 24, in verse 27, when Jesus was speaking to some who are on the way to, the, to Emmaus, it's called the road to Emmaus. It says in Luke 24, 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Later in Luke 24, 44, he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be, must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And so what Paul is simply saying is I have a biblical belief. The things that I have believed and the things that I'm sharing are things that you find in the scriptures, the law and the prophets. I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. And then in verse 15, he goes on to say, I have hope in God. Now, he makes it very clear that they themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. I have hope in God for resurrection. The word hope, the way we use it today, it's kind of like, I hope it doesn't rain today. Or I hope the Dodgers finally win a game. <laughs> you know, I hope. So we use the, the word hope in a certain way, but let me tell you with the, the Greek, when, when you see it in the New Testament, when the word hope is used very often, when it is speaking of, is not some kind of like wishful thinking. The word hope speaks of confident expectation. Paul tells us through the Romans that we are actually saved by hope. And so it's not this, man, I hope I'm saved. No, it's a confident, expe uh, confident expectation that I am saved. I have a confidence in what God has said. He doesn't change his mind. Has he said it? Will he change his mind? And the answer is no, he doesn't. So I can have confidence in what he says. So we have a hope for resurrection, a confident expectation for the resurrection. And he's saying, and this is something that some of them, the Pharisees also possess. But this is what he goes on to do, and we'll look at this. He identifies two classes of people resurrected. Notice there's the resurrection of the just as well as the unjust. Christians believe that there is a resurrection of the dead. We believe that God is the judge of the earth and all will stand before him. 
We also know through scripture that there will be a final accounting that does take place. In Romans 1, 6 through 11, Paul said, God will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. There will be judgment, is what he's saying, for the just and the unjust. Because we believe this, we share the gospel with those who are unsaved. Romans 14, 12 says, So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Daniel 12, verse 2 says, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. The knowledge that each will give an account of themselves to God, the knowledge that some will awaken to everlasting life and others to everlasting contempt is what drove me as a brand new Christian to preach to my father and to my mother, to my brother, my sisters. It's what drove me to share with my friends and others. It's a belief that we all will stand before the righteous judge, that each man, according to the word of God, will give an account of themselves to God, that some are going to have everlasting life and others will have everlasting contempt. We also know that God is just, that God ultimately will deliver perfect justice, for there is no partiality with God. In John 5, 28 and 29, Jesus said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Those who have done good, Jesus said, it's not that they work their way into the resurrection of the just. When it speaks of them doing good, it speaks of the moral quality of their lives, which was revealed by their faith. Their understanding of ultimate justice provoked them to live proper lives. This belief drives behavior. It makes you who you are. This belief, it, one day you will stand before a righteous God will drive your values. It helps to determine your behavior towards other people. This belief that there are those who do things that are righteous provokes certain things. It awakens in you love for others because God's word commands me to love others. It causes me to treat other people kindly. It causes me to do good to others. It causes me to live a life that is set apart. And that's what it's supposed to do. Paul makes it clear in verse 16 when he said, This being so, I, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and man. You see, this belief that one day you will stand before God is intended to drive your behavior. It's what you build your life on, this knowledge that one day the, the righteous God will judge you righteously. And that's what's supposed to, it's supposed to drive your, your, your life. You see, Paul believed very strongly in the resurrection of the just and the unjust. It propelled his way of life. That's why he says, I always strive to have a, a conscience without offense. I want to have a life that is godly. His belief in the resurrection of the just and the unjust propelled him. 
It's what fueled him to live righteously. It's what fueled him to live properly before God and man. It's the fear of God that caused him to strive to have a clean conscience. And it is precisely this way of thinking that unbelievers do not possess. When you do not believe that there's a judge, you will live an ungodly life. That is something plainly seen in the shootings in Las Vegas. The killer has no fear of, had no fear of God, no belief in God, no fear of final judgment. Many are posting on various media sources their prayers and their grief. You see it all over the internet right now. But there are those who are mocking the outpouring of prayer. And they are saying that they are useless. And that is precisely the problem our nation has today. I have to be careful at this point. Because some have come out, I think, and have politicized this entire situation, and they should be ashamed of themselves. They should be ashamed of themselves. Give the family some time to grieve. Give the family some time to find comfort. Let the nation pour out its concern through prayer. Why are these people writing on the internet that prayers are useless, that it's foolish, that you have to do things, what, we have to pass laws. Really, we have a lot of laws. I have never seen a law that ever makes me love somebody else. I've never seen a law that commands me to love somebody else. You cannot make me love somebody else. You can't. You can't pass a law that says, thou shalt. You can't. I can't. If America passes all these laws saying I have to do certain things, you'll find ways to get around those laws. They're missing the point. Here we go. They're missing the point of the nature of man. You have to understand something. We are in rebellion against God. We are carnal. We have murder in our hearts. We need a new nature. And that's why Jesus came. Because we are in the bondage of sin. Because our minds are darkened and our hearts are foul. And it's so severe that God himself had to rescue us. And the idea that we can somehow just talk one another into being nice. We don't, we, we, we are, as a nation, we are lost and we are blind. And, and because pastors have stopped preaching the gospel and have many Many of the churches that are very large have not equipped the church to have a biblical understanding of what's taking place. Man is evil, but we don't see it. I was listening to a speaker just this week at a pastor's conference in upstate New York who does ministry in the Sudan. And he was sharing how Muslims, Muslim rebels, have entered into certain areas where there are Christians. That's where his ministry is. And how they have committed atrocities. He said, these are things you won't read in your newspaper. These are things that nobody's reporting. They're killing Christians, he said. This man was with his son. And 
they said to him, denounce Christ, reject Christ, or you'll die. And the man and his son both refused. They said, no, we're Christians. We're followers of Jesus. So they cut his son's head off in front of him and used his head as a soccer ball and made the father watch. Are you telling me man is good? The man who came running with the body of his three-year-old daughter with no head, they cut his three-year-old baby girl's head off, and daddy's running just carrying her body. Are you telling me man is good? Are you telling me that? Man is not good. Man needs a savior. Man needs a savior. We need a new heart. We need a new life, and it doesn't come through man-made laws. It comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that transforms lives. I can tell you stories, but I'm restricted from it, not because it's just I don't want to bring embarrassment, but I'm thinking of people I know, people I know, that the Lord has done Amazing transformations in. Amazing. Haters. Killers. Men who ordered the killing of others. On, on Easter, just this last Easter, at my house, and I don't want to go into too much detail, but I will say it like this. At, at my table, at my table for Easter, there were Two men there. One man was a Mexican mafia shot caller, orders the death for people in prison. The other was a man who killed in order to get into prison. And they're sitting at my dinner table with me because they both had come to faith in Jesus Christ. See, God takes killers' hearts and changes them. And this is, amen, amen. And the society that we live in is missing the point. It's missing the point in, in, in belittling prayer, in belittling compassion, in belittling these Christian virtues and saying what we need to do is, is outlaw certain things as if that's going to make somebody not use a particular weapon. Listen, we in the United States, we have guns, but you go to Japan, they use knives. It just depends on the place that you're at. Go to England. They use knives. It's in man's heart to do these acts. Satan is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And there are those who follow that rule. That's their nature. That's why the gospel is preached. And that's why Paul is saying, I have hope in God because God promises resurrection. And there will be life after life, if you will. And the just will have a relationship with God for eternity. And they will do what is right because of the fear of God and the promises that he's given to them. But there are the unjust, like that man who killed all of those people, who will stand before the judge and give an account of himself. I wish to the Lord God he'd have been saved. But I thank God for the justice that will be served. I also thank God for the comfort that we get from him because as a believer, I grieve. I grieve. And I think, to be honest with you, I believe that believers grieve deeper than non-believers because we love more than non-believers. We have deeper relationships than non-believers, but we have a hope that goes beyond our grief. We do not sorrow as those with no hope. We know that when we say goodbye here, it's just to say hello there. We know that it's just that I'll see you later, not a, I'll never see you again, you see? And so Paul is saying, listen, it's an issue of our faith. I preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I, I preach that, and that's what they're so upset about. And he says, because I believe in this, I believe there is a judge. I believe that, that, that there is a resurrection. I live a life. I exercise my conscience in order that I might be able to walk with the Lord and have relationship with him into eternity. 
Evil is in the essence of the human nature. And again, that is why we need a new nature. And Paul strove to have a clean conscience. And Paul lived a spiritually disciplined life. In 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, he said it like this. He said, reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. You see, the result of believing is that we have hope in life and we actually close our eyes here clinging to hope. In Proverbs 14, 32, it says, the wicked is driven away in his wickedness, but the righteous has hope in his death. And this hope is fueled by the promises of God. Psalm 16, 8 through 10, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad, my glory rejoices, my flesh also will rest in hope for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Psalm 17, 15, as for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. And so he says that he always strives to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. If that's what drives us in our relationships with others, our faith in God and our hope for the future. He goes on in verse 17, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with mob nor with tumult. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council, unless it is for this one statement, which I cried out standing among them concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you. So he emphasizes that he hadn't been the cause of the disturbance. If they had a charge, they should be there presenting it. There's no eyewitnesses here. So he says, you who are here, make your charge and then prove it. He says, my crime in verse 21, I believe in the resurrection. And of course, his religious belief is not a crime. Again, Christianity hinges on resurrection. In Romans 1, 3, and 4, his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who the, through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection of the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Christianity hinges on the fact of resurrection. Well, all this is taking place, verse 22, and we'll roll to our conclusion. When Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I'll, I'll call for you. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul, that he might release him. He was wanting a bribe. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. But after two years, Porcius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. I'll close with this very quickly. Notice the heart of Paul's message, righteousness, self-control, and judgment. You have someone mentioned as Drusilla. She was the youngest daughter of Herod Agrippa. She was Felix's third wife. Well, in her teens, she had been given in marriage to the king of Emesa. She was beautiful and so beautiful that Felix stole her from her husband. At age 16, she bore him a son, so at this time, she was not yet 20 years of age. Paul speaks concerning absolute truth, righteousness, which is God's standards, self-control, man's necessary response to come into line with God's standards, and judgment, the result of not controlling yourself and failing to live up to God's ways. As he's hearing this, his response is fear. 
So he says, go away. I'll hear you when I have a convenient time. And what we have here is a picture of missed opportunity. Felix had Paul to speak to, to for two years, spoke often with him, but he was hoping for money. He feared upsetting the Jewish authorities, and the result, he lost out in heaven. He says, I'll hear you when the time is convenient, but we need to always understand one thing, guys. Now is the convenient time. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2, he says, I've heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. What we have here is Felix becoming the greatest example of a missed opportunity. The greatest example of a missed opportunity. Imagine two years hearing the mighty apostle Paul and only wishing for two years that Paul would give him some money. Think about that for a minute. 